So with the clergy with regard to freedom of religion and all, and uh, no objections. I don't think they stood off and cheered or clapped, but they threw me in the government, but it, they did it with their full knowledge that I was doing it. But now I'm out of town again, heading out on Sunday, I'll be leaving for the economic summit for a with our allies. And that's the eighth and final one for me. I'm thinking back of that first one. Then realize how far we've come. I was elected on the promise of bringing about tax reform, to increase incentive to save and invest and work, and to, and to get the government out of the way so the free market could generate a growing and vibrant economy. And uh, for the first couple of summits, I, I was just a new kid at school there, and I didn't seem to give much weight to my declarations. But then, very shortly. About the third one or so, as our economy began to expand, I walked in one day and uh, my counterparts were sitting there facing me and they almost all together demanded in a single voice to explain the American miracle. So I took great, great pleasure in explaining that miracle to them and what we had to do. But, uh, and it's caught on, all of them are now uh, reducing their taxes, particularly the upper brackets, and uh, they're, they're complaining to us about uh, their interference with private enterprise, and, and the result of it has been that we have, we've created almost two and a half times as many jobs as all of them put together. Uh, but uh, we expect to discuss uh, coordination of economic policy, agriculture, freedom of trade, and international debt among some of the other important economic issues. And I'm particularly pleased that Canada is the site for the summit since we've now embarked on this free trade area bill. And I'm now going to ask Colin to 
say a few words in the Moscow Summit, and then Jim Baker will give us a preview of the Toronto Summit. Thank you, Mr. President. We come away from Moscow believing that U.S.-Soviet relations are perhaps the best shape they've been. Well, we don't have to wait for the press this morning, so we can go right away. As you, I'm sure, are well aware of the Sandinista repression of the people of Nicaragua, according to the information we're getting, has intensified. <coughs> the talks between the freedom fighters and the Sandinistas haven't made any progress, and that's, used, that's due to the Sandinistas. They want to talk in great detail about how, about how the resistance lays down its arms, but they don't want to talk about bringing democracy to Nicaragua. In fact, one of them carelessly made a statement not too many days ago, the fact that uh, they were supportive of democratization. The, uh, uh, we're consulting the resistance leadership to get their assessment of the situation and their needs. And I've also asked Ambassador Max Campbellman to discuss the matter of the heads of the four democracies in Central America. <coughs> Yesterday, at a leadership meeting, Colin Powell outlined three possible options for consideration, and they were to do nothing. Second one, propose a military aid package now, and the third one, prepare a package but hold transmittal to Congress while we work to build support for it. I know there's a number of other ideas, but and a variety of opinion in this room. But we're interested in hearing what you think is the best course of action. So first, I'm going to ask George Schultz for his comments. Mr. President, thank you. If you look at this napkin, you say that the United States will always seek peace. And you notice that the eagle is looking at the olive branch. But the eagle also holds in the <coughs> arrows to show that the United States understands that if you're going to be effective in seeking peace, you better have strength. Otherwise, nobody's going to pay any attention to you. President, yes. Hello there. nice to meet you, sir. Nice Dan you. Fleming, well, thank you for bringing me into the Republican Party. That's when I really got active. Thank you. Well, I didn't switch myself until 62. Nice to meet you. L. Jordan, Chairman of Illinois. Nice to see you, sir. That's home country. You got that right. Sitting right in front of another room. Alina. We're all there together. <laughs> Bob Polina from Canada. Nice to see you. I want to thank you for eight splendid years. Well, thank you. President Tony Collins. Good to see you. 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 Earl Baker, Pennsylvania. Thank you much for what you've done. Nice to see you. Frank. Good morning, Mr. President. Well, I think maybe we better get at it. Your weather is as hospitable as this. You're doing your home hours. It's very beautiful. Okay. It's kind of Good morning, Senator. How are you this morning? How are you? Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Well, listen, but so that we can get lunch on the way here. Start to serve them less to us, and <laughs> unless I say a few words. It's <laughs> sort of like saying grace. I, yes, I won't do that, but I, 
I think it every day. But uh, it's wonderful to have you here, and I know that you all come from a section of the country that basically tries to claim itself as solid Democrat. But uh, I think we could, could reverse that. And the, there's just a couple of things that are haunting me and very much in my mind. One of them I think we've licked, and that is that uh, I come from the home of the 11th Commandment. California in 66, when I was running for government, was when one of the uh, campaign committee people out there coined the 11th Commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican. And I found that it works. And uh, I think we've, we've seen that happen now with our galaxy of candidates for the nomination coming forward and all together. But the other big thing is, darn it, we have the highest percentage of that youth group of 18 to 24, Republican, of any other age group. They also have the lowest percentage of voting. And I think one of our greatest problems is to get it out. When I look at the figures, we talk about our victories, and yet only about 53 or 54 percent of the people come out to vote. And down in El Salvador at their first election in 40 years, when they were being threatened with shooting by the guerrillas if they came out to vote, and 83 percent of them did vote in spite of the threats against their lives. So I think we've got to hammer that, and we've got to move strongly for the young people and face them with this. We know who they're for, but it doesn't count unless they go in and drop that thing in the box. And uh, I, I think we've got a great opportunity in this election because I don't care what the other side is saying, and uh, I know what I do care, but they're painting such a false picture. Uh, you'd think that we were in a depression or something <laughs> to hear them. But the, the facts and the figures, and that's what we've got a campaign on. And I hope that we can make them available, Frank, to, to all of them here. The things, it, it's unbelievable. I never knew till I got in this job that the potential employment <coughs> pool of America is supposed to be everybody, male and female, from 16 years of age and up. Now that means you're including all the retired, that means you're including all the kids that are still in school getting an education. We have today the highest percentage of that potential pool employed than ever in our history. 62.6% of all the people in that age group are employed. And we have, I'll be going to the economic summit with all of our trading partners up there, uh, leaving Sunday in Toronto. <coughs> But in these seven years, or going to almost full eight now, we have created 2.3 times as many jobs as all of our trading partners put together, and they have 50% more people of working age than we do. And 16.8 uh, million new jobs now. And contrary to what they'd like to point out, they aren't jobs just down there at the bottom of the scale. The great majority of those jobs have been in the upper income brackets. And I mean really up into that higher level. So uh, we've got so many things to talk about, but I'm going to quit now so it's serve lunch because I also want to hear from all of, of you about the situation. Mr. President, I might ask uh, Frank Ferenkoff to lead off if you have any opening 